moving to our next topic, you will engage in the determination of the different layout and classification of structures. Starting with the classification under the function or usage of the structure. Starting with buildings. Buildings are usually roofed and walled structures built for permanent use or for dwelling. Second is bridges. Bridges are structure carrying a pathway or roadway over a depression or obstacle. The third one is dams, which is considered a barrier preventing the flow of water or of loose solid materials. The fourth one are cableways. Cableways are a suspended cable used as a track along which carriers can be pulled. And lastly, factories. Factories are building or set of buildings which facilitates for manufacturing. So that is our first category, structures based on functions or usage. Now let's go to the next one. Structures based on transfer mechanism. Multiple elements are used to transmit and resist external loads within a building. These elements define the mechanism of load transfer in a building known as the load path. The load path extends from the roof through each structural element going to the foundation. An understanding of the critical importance of a complete load path is essential for everyone involved in building design and construction. Let's start with our building frame. So the composition of our frame, we have the column, the beam, and that composes our frame, where it transfers the loadings from one element to the other. Next is our arc bridge. Arc bridge are composed of arcs, where arcs support their loads in compression. The third one is truss bridge. Consists of slender elements forming triangles which resist actual tensile or compressive forces. And the third classification is analysis perspective. So in here, you can analyze structures in a two-dimensional or three-dimensional perspective. We are down with our two topics. Let's go to our third one, which is structural elements. In this topic, you will be introduced to the most common structural elements that composes a structure. There are three categories, tie rod, beams, and columns. Let's start with our tie rod. Structural members that are exposed to tension or tensile force are often classified as tie rods or bracing struts. Due to the nature of this load, these structural members are rather slender and are often shaped into rods, bars, angles, and channels. Second is our beam. Beams are straight horizontal members primarily carrying vertical loads. They are classified according to the way they are supported. The common way beams are supported are as follows. Simply supported beam, cantilevered beam, fixed supported beam, and continuous beam. Beams are designed to resist bending moment. However, if the beams are short and carries large loads, the internal shear force may become quite large and the force may govern its design. The third one is columns. Columns are members that are generally vertical and resist actual compressive loads, but they are also subjected to both actual and bending moment. For metal columns, tubes and wide flange cross sections are often used, while circular and square cross sections with reinforcing rods are used for those made of concrete. Our next topic is types of structures. In this topic, you will be able to describe a structural system based on the combination of its structural elements. So we have 
trusses, arcs, cables, frames, and surface structures. When structural elements and the materials that they are made of are combined, it is called a structural system. Each system is constructed of one or more of the basic structures. Let us know these type of structures starting with trusses. When a large span of structure is required and its depth is not an important criterion for a design, then a truss can be used. Trusses are composed of slender elements arranged in a triangular manner. Planar trusses are composed of members that lies on the same plane. Whereas space trusses have members extending in three dimensions and suitable for derricks and towers. First example of our truss is the Missouri River Bridge in Chamberlain, South Dakota. These thorough trusses show how complex the geometry of a large bridge truss can become. Careful study shows X bracing in all except the end panel are quite a big support. Horizontal members in the plane of the truss at mid-height are to stiffen the verticals. The second example is the John Hancock Building. In a strongly seismic area, buildings must resist horizontal inertial forces caused by the horizontal components of earthquake ground motions. The 100-story, 344-meter tall building, the John Hancock Center in Chicago, has an exterior braced frame tube structure. It is an advanced on the steel frame tube. This design added global cross bracing to the perimeter frame to increase the stiffness of the structure. Number two is arcs. Arc achieves its strength in compression due to its reverse curvature. Arcs must be rigid and are often used in bridge structures, dome roofs, and openings in masonry walls. Our first example is Ponte Fabricio Bridge. The Ponte Fabricio Bridge. Romans were pioneers in the use of arcs for bridges, buildings, and aqueducts. This bridge, the Ponte Fabricio in Rome, spans between the bank of the River Tiber and Tiber Islands. It was built in 64 BC. Our second example is Carmel Mission Church. The interior of the Carmel Mission Church was built in 1793. The design of the wall's curve goes inward towards top and the roof consists of a series of inverted catenary arcs built of native sandstones quarried from the nearby Santa Lucia Mountains. The third one is cables. Cables are flexible and carry their loads in tension. They are commonly used to support bridges and building roofs. When used as bridge support, cables have an advantage over the beam and the truss, especially for the spans that are greater than 150 feet or 46 meters. A great example for that is the Manhattan Bridge. Over New York's East River, this bridge was opened in 1909, one of the first major bridges to use steel towers. It used more flexible towers and shallower stiffening truss. Next on our list is frames. Frames are composed of columns and beams that are connected either with pin or fixed connections. Frames are often used in buildings. Like trusses, frames extend to two or three dimensions. When frames are subjected to loadings, it causes members to bend. A sample of our frames is this one-story rigid frame. Both the horizontal and vertical stability of this building depend on the concrete frame on all four sides. The second sample is our multi-story building, the first city national bank building in Houston, Texas. Concrete covered steel frame with a multi-story building. It has three bays and nine bays in land. Our last on the list is surface structures. Surface structures are made from a material having a very small thickness compared to its other dimensions. This material is flexible and can create a form of a tent or air-inflated structure. In both cases, the material acts as a membrane that is subjected to pure tension. Our first example is the Sydney Opera House. The Sydney Opera House is a modern expressionist design with a series of large precast concrete shells, each composed of sections of a sphere forming the roofs of the structure set on a monumental podium. Public Auditorium is our second example. 
Designed to serve both as a conventional hall and as an open-air amphitheater seating 13,600, the building has a retractable dome consisting of radial steel ribs sheathed in stainless steel. The dome has a diameter of 417 feet and a rise of 109 feet. Under introduction, we still have load-on structures. So in this topic, you will know the different loads acting on our structures. It is categorized into two based on nature and based on its application. Let's start based on nature. So there are five examples starting with the dead load. Dead load consists of the weights of the various structural members and the weight of any objects that are permanently attached to the structure. Hence, for a building, the dead loads include the weights of the columns, beams, and girders, the floor slab, roofing, walls, windows, plumbing, electrical fixtures, and other miscellaneous attachments. Second is the live load. Live loads can vary both in their magnitude and location. They may be caused by the weights of objects temporarily placed on a structure, moving vehicles, or natural forces. The minimum live loads specified in codes are determined from studying the history of their effects on existing structures. Usually, these loads include additional protection against excessive deflection or sudden overload. The third one on our list is the wind load. When structures block the flow of wind, the wind's kinetic energy is converted into potential energy of pressure, which causes a wind loading. The effect of wind on a structure depends on the density and velocity of the air, the angle of incidence of the wind, the shape and stiffness of the structure, and the roughness of its surface. For design purposes, wind loadings can be treated using either a static or a dynamic approach. Second to the last is our snow load. In some parts of the world, roof loading due to snow can be quite severe and therefore protection against possible failure is of primary concern. Design loadings typically depend on the building's general shape and roof geometry, wind exposure, location, its importance, and whether it is heated. Last on the list is earthquake load. Earthquakes produce loadings on a structure through its interaction with the ground and its response characteristics. These loadings result from the structure's distortion caused by the ground's motion and the lateral resistance of the structure. Their magnitude depends on the amount and type of ground acceleration and the mass and stiffness of the structure. Moving on to the next one is based on application. So there are just only three types. The point or the concentrated load, the uniformly distributed load, and the non-uniformly distributed load. Last topic for this chapter is the analytical design method. Here we have the ACI, which is the American Concrete Institute, where under it is WSD and our SD, where WSD stands for the Working Stress Design and SD for the Strength Design. This one is considered when you are designing concrete. The second one is the AISC, which is the American Institute of Steel Construction, under which we have ASD and LRFD. ASD D means allowable strength design and LRFD means load and resistance factor design. This method is used when designing steel. And the most common code that we are using in the Philippines is our NSCP, which stands for the National Structural Code of the Philippines. Now that we are done with our lesson, I hope you were able to gain new knowledge about structural theory. The next slides will be the references. So if you want to explore more and learn more about structural theory, you can go to this links provided. I hope to see you again soon. Good day, future engineers.